and to the angel of the church in Tyre write, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. Revelation 2, verse 18. Greetings in the glorious peace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to the fifth episode of this series, which addresses the historical and prophetic aspects of the seven letters of Revelation. In this fifth episode of the series, the prophetic plan of the church in the seven letters of Revelation. We will discuss the letter to the church in Thyatira. The historical period of Thyatira is presumed to be approximately between the years 590 to 1530 A.D.I. The social structure of the city of Thyatira consisted of two distinct classes of people. There were businessmen who were able to profit and acquire goods in the region for the Roman Emperor, Caesar Augustus, and the imperial family. There were also slaves who were brought and sold in Thyatira where a slave market was located. It was a prosperous city where bronze was also one of the metals worked to be cast. What we assume here is that perhaps this is the image that the Lord Jesus wanted to use to present himself to this church as the one with feet like polished brass or burnished bronze the feet that hastened to the judgment of the condemnation of sin, crushing the head of the deceitful serpent, the enemy of our souls forevermore. Thyatira was a city founded by Alexander the Great and was famous and prosperous also for its trade and industry of purple, fabric of purple or scarlet color. Thyatira was also mentioned in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 16, verse 11 to verse 15. This reference is connected to the name of Lydia, who was from Thyatira, but who lived in Philippi when she was evangelized by Paul. She was known as Lydia, the purple seller. Bronze was also cast there. It was exploited with great efficiency by commerce and produced in several local industries, making the city famous despite not being a great metropolis. The word Thyatira means continuous sacrifice. It refers to the highlighted period of the Middle Ages when the worship of idols and the supposed liturgical repetition of the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus equate to an inversion of the value of the act of Calvary. This inversion of value, which was intended to distort God's work, transformed God's goodwill towards men into a cult of man's goodwill towards God. Thyatira represents the historical period from the 6th to the 16th century. It is the Middle Ages, which lasted approximately a thousand years. A time of repentance was given by the Lord Jesus to Thyatira. And I gave her time to repent of her immorality, but she did not repent. Revelation, chapter 2, verse 22. The synagogue mentioned in Smyrna, in chapter 2, verse 9, was once again evident in Thyatira. As it brought from the Old Testament the entire liturgical and Levitical system, emphasizing the literal biblical text, or the letter, and nullifying the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus. The liturgy of worship in the prophetic period, represented by Thyatira, was merely to say that Jesus is dead. Tolerance towards Jezebel. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. Revelation chapter 2, verse 20. Here, the prophetic figure of error is clearly evident, as an unfaithful church is named after a woman transposing the name and deeds of Jezebel. Her memory in the Old Testament is associated with corruption, idolatry, vanity, deception, and witchcraft. She is highlighted as abominable 
in all her deeds. Used to deceive, corrupt, and distance God's people, Jezebel, the daughter of a Sidonian king, worshiper of Baal. She introduced idolatry and religious corruption into Israel. Here, she symbolizes apostasy and religious corruption. The church here became paganized. False prophecy during this period of the church's life is well represented in the figure of Jezebel, the queen who, with all authority and deceit, rules and governs through the perverted and impure system of Balaam and the hierarchy of Satan's throne, existing since ancient times in Pergama. Revelation chapter 2, verses 14 to 15 records this. In this period, all the false doctrines became even more evident. Old Testament doctrines, which emphasized works rather than true faith. Tradition instead of the Bible. The material kingdom instead of the spiritual kingdom. Idolatry. The murderous and bloodthirsty frenzy that paganism demonstrated in the early centuries against the faithful church were now instigated by the woman Jezebel. She instituted, at the beginning of the second millennium, the martyrdom of the faithful. This was the period called the Inquisition. Nothing here is different from the spirit that operated in Ahab's wife. Remembered in the Old Testament through the biblical texts in the books of First and Second Kings. What Jezebel did, according to Revelation, chapter 2, verse 20. In her position as queen, Jezebel usurped the throne, politically dominating to madly intervene in the spiritual destiny of a people, especially to lead this people astray. Similar to the social structure of the city of Thyatira, the religious structure that dominated the prophetic period of Thyatira created universities. In these universities, there were only two classes of people, the wise and the ignorant. The wise were those who were the masters of the universities, and the ignorant were those who had no knowledge of the scriptures. Access to the scriptures was restricted only to the masters of the universities. For this, such masters appropriated, differentiating themselves from philosophy and theology to create an ideology of ecclesiastical power. The fossilized doctrine of Thyatira consisted in that all doctrinal understanding had to be used to serve the interests of the dominant religious structure. By this time, the throne of Christ on earth was already occupied by a religious governing structure, which claimed for itself the prerogatives of infallibility and universal authority. At the same time, this structure had a substitute for the throne of Christ in heaven, occupied by a queen. We remind that our approach is being made in a prophetic sense. The religious governance system during this period, established with Gregory for first, defines once and for all the succession sequence. This system had the right to maneuver politically, using spiritual supremacy to canonize, excommunicate, charge fees for sacraments, self-forgiveness of sins, among others. In verse 24 of chapter 2, of Revelation, the phrase, this doctrine is mentioned. It refers to the doctrine of the depths of Satan, already established and prepared by the Antichrist, which briefly interposes three designations here, which are the mortar of false prophecy, bonhomism, 
represented by materialism, in verse 14. Nicolaism, represented by religious power, in verse 15. Jezebelism, represented by political power, in verse 20. All teachings resulted in nullifying the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus by preaching salvation through works, creating liturgies, and practicing idolatry. Let us see the relationship between the parable of the leaven and the letter to Thyatira. The text of God's Word tells us this. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal, till it was all leaven. Matthew chapter 13, verse 33. The three measures of flour represent the doctrine of the Trinity. First, in Ephesus, the doctrine was established, the word of the Father. Second, in Smyrna, the doctrine was lived, the death and resurrection of the Son. Third, in Pergamum, faith was confirmed by the Holy Spirit. What was in the woman's measure of yeast? This is the question. Revelation chapter 2 verse 20 says, to teach and deceive my servants so that they commit fornication and eat things sacrificed to idols. First, to teach and deceive my servants. The church whose faithful faced opposition to the doctrine, that church was Ephesus. Second, eating things sacrificed to idols. The church whose faithful did not deny Jesus even giving their lives. This happened in Smyrna. Third, committing fornication. The church whose faithful did not forsake the true love that is Jesus to exchange for other loves or other saviors. That church was Pergamum. The great evidence in Thyatira was the liturgical worship where the doctrine of tares and leaven stood out with great emphasis, which came with the intention of replacing the truth with the deceptive appearance of a fully leavened dough. All the struggle in that period was to deceive and replace the great doctrine lived by the Church of Smyrna. A Letter to Pergamon the Lord Jesus had already given a warning regarding the woman's intentionally added measure of yeast. It was the connection with the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast stumbling blocks before the children of Israel. To eat things sacrificed to idols and commit sexual immorality, Revelation chapter 2, verse 14. The yeast in Thyatira. It is not the yeast of the Church of Christ. It is not the must of Pentecost wine, the Holy Spirit, which comes from within outward, but what comes from the outside to the inside. This is the yeast that the woman cunningly uses to leaven and thus contaminate the dough of the three measures of wheat. And we make it clear that yeast dough is not a blessing, but a curse for it represents the innovations of heresies that were introduced into the already existing three measures of wheat to sour the dough. With great audacity, the woman here, represented by an unfaithful ecclesiastical structure, placed the yeast of heresy in the purity of the kingdom in the perfection of the biblical doctrine of the Trinity. Operation of the spirit of counsel in the church of Thyatira, and the spirit of counsel shall rest upon him. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. The emphasis of the Holy Spirit's operation in Thyatira is the spirit of counsel. Counsel to the faithful remnant in Thyatira, verse 25. Hold fast what you have till I come, a promise already made to the church, the church in Pergamum, of the coming of the sword of the Lord's mouth to battle against those who oppress the faithful so much. Revelation chapter 2, verse 16. For this church, the Lord Jesus makes three promises. 
verse 24. I will not impose on you another burden, a promise to the faithful who do not have the false doctrine of Thyatira. Verse 26. I will give them power over the nations. Ah, not political or religious power, but the power of God in the gospel, capable of reaching many nations. Verse 28. I will give them the morning star, a reference to the millennium with Christ, the true millennium. Every promise here refers to the millennial period, during which the Holy Spirit emphasizes the dominion and lordship of the Son of God over the nations. This promise contrasts with the temporal and political dominion that an unfaithful religious structure sought to possess here on earth. Whoever has ears, hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Revelation chapter 2, verse 29. We conclude this fifth episode of the series, The Prophetic Plan of the Church in the Seven Letters of Revelation. And we will await you in the next episode, where we will present our topic related to the next letter, which is the letter to the church in Sardis. Until then, go with the Lord Jesus.